Good morning. I hope everybody had a great Christmas day yesterday with your family and loved ones. Um, I just want to thank you, too, on behalf of everybody. Just uh, We had a great end of the month of November and all of December. Just so much ministry going on and so many people involved in it. It was awesome. Um, and just realize that probably yesterday, I will figure yesterday or the day before, millions and millions of kids uh, received those shoeboxes. And if you saw the big cartons, those held about 15 or 16 shoeboxes. So you saw all those cartons downstairs. So kids were being blessed. But the greatest thing is not only that strangers would give them a gift, but in it, besides their toys, was also uh, comic books and coloring books and the gospel presentation on their level. And they say the average is seven to eight people, I believe it is, get touched by one child who receives a Christmas box. So their families or relatives or friends. So it's a tremendous ministry. And thank all of you for participating, whether it was financially or bringing in a box or praying or coming here and serving. It's just great. If you could open up the book of life to Colossians chapter 3. The greatest selling book of all time is the Bible. Is that amazing? The greatest selling book of all time. Probably the most widely read book of all time. But how many people understand it. Scholars read it, but can't really see the spiritual insight in it unless they're born again. So we have a privilege because we can dive into God's word and hear from God himself, his heart, his spirit. Some people who are sick are back here today. It's good seeing you guys and girls. That's awesome. Hope everybody's feeling good up in the balcony. But we're in a Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that during this, uh, these next moments that you would just pour out your spirit on each person that is hearing. I pray that you would bless once again your words as they're spoken and that people's lives would be changed and that people would draw closer to you. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The original title was, Do You Know Your Position in Jesus? That's probably the title that's in your bulletin right now. But about six minutes ago, I changed it. I used to do that all the time. I'd have a certain basketball play, and we were playing a team. And boy, when I saw them warming up, or something, I said, I've got to change this play or something. So, on the fly. So, the title of the message I changed it to is, What is Your Position in Jesus? What is your position in Jesus? There are three things I would like to look at this morning about your position in Jesus. Number one is, were you raised? Were you raised? Number two, are you seeking? And number three is, where is Jesus? Let's take a look at these three points. It says in verse one, if then you were raised with Christ, this is speaking biblically, and if you were raised, that means you were dead spiritually. You were dead because of your sins. Jesus Christ's death on the cross at Calvary allows you and me to die to our old life, and it's symbolized when we baptize people here, or if you've seen a baptism, it's symbolized in the first half of baptism when you go underwater. It's symbolic that you're dying to yourself. His resurrection from the tomb secures our new life, which is symbolized in the second half 
of baptism when you are raised out of the water into new life. In Romans chapter 6, verses 4 and 5 and verses 9 to 11, it says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Are you and I walking in newness of life? Verse 5, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Are you in the likeness of his resurrection today? Verses 9 to 11 of Romans 6, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Do you understand that's, those are verses that you can study probably for now until the Lord comes back. And still, they're so rich that you could get so much out of them if you keep chewing on them and squeezing. Understand, you and I will never perish or be snatched out of Jesus' hand. You know, there's gorilla glue, there's crazy glue. Well, you know, there's Jesus glue. God has given us eternal life, and that life is in his Son. He who has a son has life, and he who does not have the son does not have life. If you have turned from your self-directed lifestyle and are following God's direction, you are crucified with Jesus, and it is no longer you that are living. But it is Jesus living in you, and now you live by faith in the Son of God, who will always love you, and he gave himself for you, you, hopefully, have chosen to give yourself to him. David Jeremiah, who is a pastor, puts it that God has placed a double lock on the security of our lives. A double lock. We are in Jesus, and Jesus is in God. That's great security. That we're in Jesus, and Jesus is in God. There's your double lock. You're doubly secure. Second thing I like to look at is seeking. Second part of that verse, verse 1 of Colossians 3 says, Seek those things which are above, where Christ is. Do you have a desire for things of heaven? Be honest with yourselves. Do you have a desire for the things of heaven? Do you actually investigate what those things are. Are you educated in those things? The Greek verb translated seek conveys the idea of setting one's heart on something long, termed, and then looking forward to it with growing emotion. Do you find that you're getting more and more emotionally involved in looking towards those things of heaven? If not, there is a reason and if you are, keep on keeping on what you're doing. Pursue the things of heaven where our citizenship is, where we wait for Jesus, our Savior, who will one day transform our limited, decaying, earthly bodies and make it just like his glorious body. You don't have to raise your hand, but did any of you use deodorant today? Tomorrow, when you wake up, go like that. You're decaying. Don't seek after earthly things, which cloud our view of heavenly things and our temporary pleasures that fade away. Invest in eternal things. You know what they are? God, His Word, and people. Those are eternal things, not temporary things. Wrap yourselves in the arms of Jesus. Let him wrap his arms around you in a spiritual sense. 
Remember what happened to all the wrappings yesterday that were torn apart and thrown away, right? Jesus' wrap is never thrown away. Never. Matthew, it says in Matthew, tells, it tells what our proper pursuit should be. To seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and God will take care of our needs. The next verse, this is uh, Matthew 6, 33, the very next verse, verse 34, is so important, and I think so apropos to today. And it should be part of our strategy. You might run out of ink if you're taking notes right now. Ready? I'm going to be long-winded on this one. Don't worry. Period. That's it. Don't worry. The second verse of Colossians 1 says, to set our mind on the things above, not on earthly things. Is your will and emotions on the reality of heaven? Or is your will and emotions tied up to the things that are on this earth that cause you stress and worry? Is that what is motivating you or are you concerned with the earthly things? It's very important to see where you put your heart. Matthew 6, 21 says, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. Are you full of life this morning? Are you full of life on a general, regular day? You know, your spiritual life impacts your uh, physical life. To be living to gratify the flesh is death, but spiritually minded, there is life and peace. Do you have that life and do you have that peace? Do you have a void in your life, in your soul? Does it feel empty? You know, in his presence, there is fullness and joy. At God's right hand are pleasures forever. And guess who's at God the Father's right hand? Jesus, his son, who is our portion forever never runs out, never gets old. How many things that we got yesterday will be old in a month, in two months, by this time next year? We'll forget what we got yesterday. Unless you're still driving it or something or flying it, which would be cool. (laughs) If you're flying it, I want to see it. No thief can rob Jesus from you. And no moth can destroy anything that he's ever given to you. Psalm 73, 25 starts out with a question. Whom do I have in heaven but you? One more time. Who do I have in heaven but you? Isn't it cool when the question also has the answer? You, Jesus. That's who I have in heaven. Him. It continues, that same verse, and there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. Is that true of you? Is that true of me? Is Jesus your heart's desire? Jesus is the path of life. As we stay in his presence is fullness and joy. Hebrews 11, verses 13 to 16. Hebrews is the hall of faith. You know, we have on this planet the hall of fame for all different sports. Great athletes, men and women in the hall of faith, whether it be basketball, football, baseball, whatever, hockey, whatever. doesn't matter. They're in the hall of fame. Well, there's a hall of faith, and that's in Hebrews 11, if you ever want to read it. The first 12 verses mention a lot of the people in the hall of faith. And you would be amazed at some of those people. You might be able to identify with some of those people. You and I might be some of those people. And they're in the hall of faith. 
Verse 13 to 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them from afar off. They were assured of them. They embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. I don't know if you've ever gone maybe out of state or out of country for a period of time, a week, two weeks, whatever. And after a while, you couldn't wait to get back home. It felt good getting back into your natural environment. It was nice where you were, but boy, there was no place like home. Ruby slippers, I didn't wear them, nope. There's no place like home. We appreciate home. But the Bible says that you and I are just pilgrims on this earth. We're just passing through. We're heading home. We're not home yet. And that's why it's important we hold on to things in this earth lightly. Because they can zap our energy. The people in Hebrews who received these promises did not see their fulfillment in their lifetime. But by faith they saw their distant home of heaven and knew God was a promise-keeping God. He delivers both in this life and in the next. Jesus told us in John chapter 14, verse 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Do you understand that? He's preparing a place for you and me. And one day we'll be with him in that place. You and I need to do a few things. Number one, the biggest thing we need to do is stay in the Word of God. That's it. We have to be immersed in it. We have to be wrapped in it. We have to let it wrap all around our heart. It's got to be inside our heart, outside our heart. It's got to be above us, below us, on the side. It's got to be all around us. That's so important for us, especially in the days that we live in. Oh my goodness, there is so many things that are being thrown at us from young kids all the way to older people. And a lot of people are believing a lie because they don't really understand and know the truth. You need to be students of the scripture, whether you're a young person here, a preteen, a teenager, doesn't matter. A millennium, they say 47 of the millennials have fallen away from the church. 47%. That's a lot. May it never be so of anybody in that age group here. Dive into God's word. Whether you're dry or wet when you dive in. If you're not getting anything out of it, keep reading. Keep asking God to reveal it to you. So important. We need to stay in God's word, number one, to renew our mind. Talk about decay. Our minds are decaying unless they're spiritually born again. And if they are born again, we can't let the decay of the old mind stink up the new mind that we have in Christ. And the only way you're going to wash your mind and fill your mind and saturate your mind is by diving into God's word. So many people, right, in, in January, I'm going to do, I'm going to start a new diet. I'm going to read the Bible every day. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to go for a run. I'm going to lift. I'm going to do whatever. Then by January 7th, they're waiting for January 1st <laughs> to start all over again. You don't have to do that. Get into God's word. Renew your mind daily. We have so much dead time in a day. It's amazing. Whether we're walking, driving. 
different parts of things that we're doing in our home. There's so much time we can be thinking and talking to God, meditating on a word maybe we read in the morning. Keep bombarding yourself with his word. So renew your mind. Number two, it's important to have your mind renewed so you can be battle ready. We're in a battle. There's a battlefield going on. You're not in the place you are in to be defeated in that battle. Businessmen, businesswomen, teachers, policemen, government workers, students, athletes, club people, drama people, doesn't matter who you are. You are chosen by God, the king of the universe. You're his kids. You stay in his word. You let his, shine, his light shine through you to a world that's getting darker and darker. Be battle ready. Be battle ready when you go to bed. Be battle ready when you wake up in the middle of the night. Be battle ready when you get out of bed in the morning. And be battle, re battle ready as you go through your day. The only way you can do that is staying in his word. And as, as Ephesians 6 talks about, is have on the armor of God. All the pieces of the armor of God. You don't know what the armor is? Read Ephesians 6. You'll see it. Third reason we need to stay in God's word besides renewing our mind and being battle ready is to overcome temptations. The enemy is a great strategist. He knows if he can get you off your game, make you feel guilty or bad or an inferior Christian, he's got you maybe for a day, maybe for a year, maybe for 20 years, that you'll just be put on a shelf because you want to be there. I got a secret. We're all spiritual failures when we try to make it on our own. If I dive into a swimming pool without water in it, whew, I'm in trouble. But boy, if there's water in that swimming pool when I dive in, I'm going to get all wet. The water of God's word. Immerse yourself in it. Don't stick your little toe in it. Don't stick your finger in it. Dive in. Let it cover you. Immerse yourself in God's word to overcome temptations. So the last point in that first verse of, Col of Colossians 3. Where is Jesus? After Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of his Father, making intercession for us, and one day he will be coming in the clouds. Now, it be, we talked about this before, to be great if we go, all go up in the clouds together. Huh, my vertical jump will never have been that high. That would be awesome. Or when I fall asleep, because this will die. But my spirit, my soul, will live forever, waiting for that new body that will never be destroyed. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, it says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance 
obtained a more excellent name than they. That at the name of Jesus, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And that if you can confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you're saved. You're in. You don't need to have a passport stamp. The price has already been paid at the cross of Calvary a couple thousand years ago by Jesus Christ. He shed his blood for your sins and for mine. In uh, the second chapter of Ephesians, it says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Physically, right now, you might be sitting in a pew. But spiritually speaking, you should be sitting in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. Is your true identity and purpose hidden in Jesus? One more time. Is your true identity and purpose hidden in Jesus? Do people outside of Jesus Christ, those who aren't believers, understand your motivation and goals? Probably not, right? They think you're whack. They think something's wrong with you. You must be born again to have heavenly vision. You cannot have heavenly vision unless you're born again. Princeton's right down the road. Geniuses. Oh, my goodness. Some of those guys right, can do the Rubik's Cues in like 10 seconds. I threw it away. I threw mine away a long time ago. Got a headache. <laughs> but they don't have spiritual vision. How come? Because they haven't been born again. They haven't been given a new identity. They don't, they're, they're not a new creature in Christ. You must be born again to be raised up. You must be born again to be able to seek. And you must be born again to understand where Jesus Christ is. Jesus sent his Holy Spirit. Remember he said that when he was leaving? Don't fear. I'm going to send you a helper, a comforter to go alongside you, the paraclete, which means to travel along with you. He sent his Holy Spirit to bring us into the presence of the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit resides in every single believer. Do you know your position? Are you ready to be raised, to seek, to know? Back in the beginning, if then you were raised with Christ, those, those four short verses, it's a continual thing to be continually raised, to be continually sitting, to be continually seeking. It's not just a one-time thing. It's something that you pursue th throughout your lifetime. And the Holy Spirit brings you there. He matures you as you continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Come to Jesus. He took your place on the cross so you could take a place with him in heaven. Let's pray. Dear Father, you're awesome. Dear Jesus, we praise you and love you for everything you've done for us. We thank you for coming into the world. It's a time of the season that we celebrate. Dear Holy Spirit, we thank you for living inside every believer. In a minute or so, I'm going to ask the worship team to just play a little chorus. But there might be a visitor here, there might be a friend here, there might be somebody on the internet watching, and they don't know this Jesus. They've heard carols singing in the malls or on TV or whatever, but they don't know Jesus. And it's important, Jesus came that everybody would know him, no matter where they are from in this, on this planet. 
even those little kids and their parents who are, might be atheists or pagans in different parts of the world, if they're given a chance to hear how much Jesus loves them, so much that he came down from heaven to this earth to die on a cross for them, for them and for their sins. First thing you have to do if you're a visitor here or listening is to realize that you're a sinner, just like me. We've done things wrong. We've missed the mark. That's what sin means, missing the mark. No matter how good I want to be, I fall and I sin. And Jesus loved us so much that he came down to die in our place on a cross because, you see, if I die in my sins without a Savior, I'm eternally banished from his presence forever, ever in a place called hell, and eventually the resting place will be the lake of fire, the Bible says. God does not want any person to go there, ever, ever. He wants your heart to be changed, to come to him, to change your lifestyle and adopt his. And with that adoption into his family is an inheritance you become his son. You become his daughter. You have eternal life. You realize you are just passing through this world to one day meet him in the clouds or meet him right in heaven. The Bible says the moment we close our eyes, the world says death. The Bible calls it sleep for the believer. The moment a believer goes to sleep and opens his eyes, he's in the presence of Jesus. How awesome. How better can it be than that? So if you are hearing God's call today, we would like you to receive Jesus, whether it be at home or here. If you're here, we'd like you to just come up and we'll just say a prayer with you to receive the Lord. So I'm going to ask Pastor Paul and Sue to uh, just sing a song. And if during the song... You feel so moved. Please come on up and we'll pray with you. Father, if there is anyone here or at home that would like to receive you as their Savior and make room in their heart, just say this prayer. Dear Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. And I know that you came from heaven to earth to die on the cross for my sins. But I know also, Lord, you were resurrected. You're alive. Pour out your Holy Spirit. I want to follow you all the days of my life. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
You know, you, if you're here today or watching, you, you're a believer, if you are a believer. The verses I read today talked about you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. There's going to be a day that everything is going to be revealed. We know we have salvation. We know we have God's Holy Spirit. We know we're not the person we used to be and that God is still working on us. But one day when Jesus Christ appears, then you're also going to appear with him in glory. You'll be in that glory and all those things that God has promised us will be revealed. They won't be hidden anymore. Today, just realize how much God loves you, how much he cares for every single one of you. And now let's just go out praising him, right guys? Amen. Please stand.